what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, getting over the barriers that you need to get over if you're attempting to try and get an innovation into a, a corporate, a large corporate. So this won't necessarily apply what I'm saying today to people that are setting up a standalone innovation. This is more the sort of innovation where you want to, to get inside a company and actually sell your idea to a company. So that's the sort of thing that I'm going to be talking about today. This is a tremendous time uh, to be innovating in this area. There are a lot of opportunities now in uh, using technology to innovate and to help corporates to make significant changes to the way they operate. Uh, they've all got um, uh, a, a definite requirement now to improve efficiency, uh, to improve productivity. You've probably seen a lot of the articles in the press about productivity and how that's not really moving, particularly in this country. A lot of that is going to change when people have to start paying uh, a living wage. So people have to be able to drive out efficiency much more effectively. So there's an opportunity to use IT, uh, innovations around devices, you know, hardware, but also to use information. In fact, during the lunch just now, I was talking to a, an astrophysicist who's got a, a, who works in the area of processing massive amounts of data uh, coming from the um, other galaxies or far galaxies, terabytes of data per day. And he then tries to spot patterns in that data and that's just the sort of thing that companies are trying to do now to be able to innovate and to, to understand their customer base and behaviours and that sort of thing. So you can see that there are opportunities to use innovations that come out of a university like this, uh, put them together across faculties and, and departments and to innovate to help companies. So what I want to do now is to go through some, some of the um, uh, issues around using big companies and try to give you an insight into how you might get over some of those and uh, to help you. Um, some companies uh, are innovators anyway. If you look at someone like Google, they actually have parts of their organisation that are dedicated to incubating new ideas. They go out actively looking for them and helping to broker the, the, the innovator, which might be a small company, might be two or three individuals with an idea, but they broker that uh, into the company so that they handle that interface between those, those people and the complexity of a large corporate. Uh, but they're fairly rare. There are an awful lot of companies out there that need to innovate. They don't have that sort of incubation unit. And Future Worlds, and uh, also the um, uh, Research and Innovation Services Group here, are set up really to help you to get over those, those barriers. So I'll come on in a minute to how that, that works. Um, what I want to do first is to start looking at the proposition. Because one of the things I've found, certainly in the mentoring side of things, is that uh, often propositions um, They've been thought through from the point of view of, of what you can provide, but there isn't an understanding of how corporates work, and, and getting that proposition right is so important. You want to get over that first hurdle of getting into the, the corporate. I'm going to be using a case study through the talk today. Uh, Ruben has very kindly um, allowed me to use uh, a project that he and I worked on about 18 months ago, I think it was, um, where Ruben and a colleague in the university developed uh, a new product, and this product uh, is called Julo, and it consisted of a piece of hardware, a USB device that uh, would log temperatures in a house. So you put it on a, a mantelpiece somewhere in your house and it would log the temperature over a period of time. Uh, you would then plug that device into your laptop and it would load up the data into an application running over the internet. That application has inside it um, a logic and an algorithm and access to external data, to be able to process that data coming up from uh, the device, and to be able to deduce whether the house is, uh, has got efficient insulation, and also whether the heating system is working effectively in the house. Now, Ruben uh, and his colleague were thinking through how that, what sort of customers that might uh, be of interest to, and uh, energy companies were obviously a first, um, first port of call. So this device and this solution actually helps the householder it also helps an energy company because the energy company will be able to sell on uh, other services based on understanding whether a house is efficient or not. For example, boiler replacement or, or insulation services, improving the insulation in a house. So Julie was designed in, in that way, set up and um, put into a proposition around targeting energy companies. Okay. So uh, I'll use this example as we go through to illustrate some of the, the techniques. What I want to do now is to move on to the proposition. It's extremely important, I think, that when you're thinking of an innovation, how it would apply to a corporate, 
you spend a lot of time up front thinking about the proposition. It's extremely important that you think about who is going to buy the product, uh, what the product is actually, what the problem is that you're trying to solve. So be very clear on that. You know, because if you look at uh, Ruben's uh, situation, <laughs> he was solving a problem for the householder, but also for the, the company. And he was also starting to think about the buyer in that company and what problem that buyer is actually trying to resolve as well. So the person he was targeting was going to be in the product development marketing side of things. So he was thinking, what, what can I actually do to help that person in their role? So thinking through that proposition, who is going to buy it, is important. Also thinking about who else is out in the market. So do plenty of research to see whether your proposition actually been solved or your problem has been solved by somebody else. And if it hasn't been solved by somebody else, why not? Is there some barrier, some regulation or something out there that's stopping somebody from exploiting your, your innovation? Okay. Um, the other thing then is uh, trying to understand the gaps in the market. So for instance, if somebody is out there with a proposition, uh, what, what about that proposition isn't working today? Why isn't that as effective as it could be? And is there some innovation now that can improve that proposition? And then finally, actually thinking about the, the value. How would you actually make, it, make money? So is it worth actually solving this problem? I think it's very important. So there are about five things there that you need to think through when you're coming up with your proposition. By the way, don't worry about notes on this. I've got some notes in with the, the slides, so you'll be able to, to pick this information up later. But those are the five things, five questions that you need to be asking when you're thinking through your proposition. And so as a mentor, those are the things that I look for when I talk to people. And if you do that piece of work, you start to see then who is going to be the buyer. So you start to understand now who's actually going to buy this, this proposition. What I want to do now is to talk a little bit about the structures of companies and how they buy. So I think this is extremely important. I know talking to Ruben, uh, I think it was quite a shock, Ruben, wasn't it, when it um, started to get involved with a large company, how difficult it is to deal with them because it's like a multi-headed hydra. You're not dealing necessarily, you know, the person you might think is the buyer that you're, you're uh, talking to isn't necessarily the only person involved in taking decisions. And it's extremely important to identify the right person to talk to as well in a company. And again, this is where research and innovation services can help you because they've got an ability to introduce you to the right people in companies. Uh, but if you look at a typical company, you'll notice that they're divided up generally into about three main groupings or three main organisation components. Uh, you've got the board and the executive management, but, but below that, you tend to find that they've got business units. So, for instance, if you look at BP, it's got exploration and production, and it's got refining. Okay, so those are business, examples of business units. If you look at a bank like Barclays, you'll find that it's got retail banking, it's got credit cards, and it's got uh, investment banking. So those are examples of business units. So you need to understand uh, from your pro proposition which part of the company you want to be able to target. The other component of a company, is, particularly for a multinational, is a geographic unit. So you may find that uh, if you look at somebody like BP, they'll have operations in different countries. And so you'll find that they'll also have an organisation structure and they'll have, for instance, transport and logistics, legal, regulatory, local HR, local IT in each country. But they'll also have a group function. So they'll have a group IT which looks at overall architecture and it handles things like running of uh, mainframe systems for all the applications for all the different business units and so on. So you'll find that there are structures that operate globally. Now, so you need to be quite clear with your proposition which parts of the company you want to be able to target where you would uh, be best, uh, best off actually putting your efforts to try and get into the company. So, for instance, if you're looking at improving workforce efficiency, it may be that you'd want to go to the HR department at the centre in the group level. Right? If you're looking at something that uh, is transport and logistics focused, but in a particular country, given the type of transport and logistics in that country, then you might go to the geographic unit of the company. Okay. I think the next step then, I think, uh, is, is actually thinking about your proposition, what your, actually, your, your innovation uh, includes, and how that relates to solving the problem that the customer's got. Now, when I was working with Ruben, we had um, quite a lot of discussions about this particular aspect, because Ruben had a very well-developed solution. He had a piece of hardware that he developed, and he piloted and tested. He also had an application 
that um, was uh, tested as well and was able to process data and had been demonstrated that it, it worked. Um, he also had access out to external data, so he proved his concept, basically, so it was quite well developed. But the sort of issues that he faced when he went into a large energy company were, were quite interesting. One of them was around intellectual property. Uh, we had to think through carefully about uh, how Ruben would still protect his opportunity to exploit his innovation, uh, potentially with other uh, customers out there. But at the same time, the company wanted, didn't want Ruben to offer the same opportunity to other competitors. So a lot of thought went into exclusivity and discussions about exclusivity and how much leeway Ruben was willing to give to the customer in order for them to feel comfortable that um, they could progress with the, uh, the proposition. The other thing that Ruben thought through was um, expertise and uh, his team. Uh, it was just himself and a colleague working on this proposition. And uh, if you look at the, the risk from the point of view of the customer, uh, they would look at that and they would think, hang on a minute, you know, we're just going to now go to a pilot, uh, from a pilot to something where maybe there's 100,000 of these units out in uh, customers' homes. Uh, that energy company could potentially have reputational damage if something went wrong with that system. Uh, and also, if there was a fault with the, the ability to load the data up in the evenings, uh, then they would want to be able to get access to expertise to fix that problem quickly. So clearly, just having one other person in the team wasn't going to be sufficient. So Ruben did a lot of thought about how to, to address that. And one of the options then was to train the, um, the client and actually pass on the information about how to maintain that product to the client. So he was able to fill that gap and address that issue with the client by thinking that type of option through. Um, the other one that uh, he thought through was data. He was originally offering to host the application on a cloud-based solution. But when we started thinking through things like data protection, and issues around information security and the fact that client data was going to be stored on this hosting platform in quite large volumes, uh, that the risk around that was just too great. So Ruben then decided to think about handing the processing over to the client and the proposition then changed right, so that the client would basically do that hosting. So you can see there that you need to think carefully about the proposition, about risk from the point of view of the, the customer and how you form that proposition to match the, the specific customer's requirements. Right, the next thing that I want to talk about now is how do companies make decisions? So one of the key things that companies use when they're making a decision to buy something or to buy a, a proposition is risk. Uh, most companies have some form of decision-making process where the decisions get escalated to different levels of management depending on the level of risk that they're taking. For example, if you're looking at uh, the, the Julo solution, there was significant potential for reputational damage if this product went out into the marketplace and didn't work, or potentially gave information that was wrong. Say, for instance, it uh, gave information about household efficiency that uh, wasn't correct. And based on that, then the energy companies started selling on additional products based on that information. You can see that there could be quite significant reputation damage from that. So you need to think about those sorts of issues and make sure that what you're proposing addresses those in some way. So Ruben started thinking then about testing the product out where it was being produced. He also started thinking about supply chain risk. With, uh, he couldn't actually get the volumes of uh, devices produced in time for a marketing campaign. So all these sorts of things you start to have to think about. So risk is a very key element to making your proposition work. And understanding the risk that the buyer, the individual that you're dealing with in the corporate, is having to face. Because that individual will be very aware that behind them, They've got the IT department looking at information security risk around the data. They've got the IT department looking at feasibility, whether that, that uh, solution actually works technically. You've then got legal looking at uh, IP protection. They don't want to buy a product from Rubin only to find that he's then used some IP in his solution that is, is from another provider, and he doesn't have the right to use that. So IP risk and uh, the legal contract, making sure there's a solid contract in place, is really important. So legal inside a corporate will have a very key role to play. Operations. Now, when you put a, an information technology type product or service into a, a corporate, it has to be integrated into their production systems. Now, most companies now in the world uh, use a standard called ITIL. Has anyone here heard of ITIL? Cool. Right, there's one person. Yeah, it's called the IT Information Library. And it was developed in the UK many years ago to help people to 
manage um, operations or IT related operations in an effective way and it's now become an international standard ISO 20000 and it's extremely important and on operations we'll look at ITIL and whether the um, service that you're proposing to put into a corporate will actually be able to fit in with the existing operations and service management so if you're going to put something if you're coming up with an innovation that's going to end up in a corporate and it relates to information technology you need to understand ITIL. You'll find that that will end up in the contract. You'll have obligations around what you need to do in order to, to work in with service management um, uh, processes. Finance. Finance will be important because they'll do modelling of different scenarios. They'll be looking at risk to the, the corporate from going in with a, um, uh, an innovation, particularly innovations which involve volume. So in um, uh, Ruben's case, he was looking at something where it would go in in the hundreds of thousands. So they wanted to look at things like pricing. You know, how, how were they going to handle pricing if the unit prices of his devices were too high? And if it suddenly took off and they were talking about millions of these devices, then you know, it, could, uh, it could have a significant financial impact on them. So they would look at and they would model the business case for the corporate actually buying this product and this service from Rubin in terms of different outcomes. So again, you need to be thinking about those sorts of outcomes when you come up with a proposition to go into that company. And that's going to have an impact on your negotiations about pricing. Another unit which you tend to only find in regulated companies is often there's an organisation called risk management. Risk management will take all of those different risks and it will help to pull those together and present them in a form where a corporate can make key decisions. And if you take the, the situation with Ruben, um, he had significant issues around reputational damage uh, if something went wrong. Um, there's also the financial case, so the corporate would want to understand that financial case and how it would turn out different scenarios. So somebody in that organisation would take that role of pulling together that risk profile for that decision so that then management can actually take an informed set of decisions. And depending on the level of risk, uh, that decision can be taken at different levels in the company. And this can introduce quite a time factor into the decision-making process. So don't be surprised if, uh, if you've got something which potentially has significant benefits for a company, but also may have some risks associated with it, that that decision process may actually take quite some time to get through those levels. Now, I've talked so far about the risks to the corporate. I now want to talk about risks to you as a, an innovator. So... This is the flip side of things, and you need to be certainly thinking about this as you go through this process of engaging with a, a company. And I've put up there uh, five key risk areas that I think are important to, to concentrate on. One of them is around uh, legal issues. So I talked earlier about IP. When one of the, the key things that you need to be able to protect is your innovation, you know, the intellectual property that you're putting into that innovation. Now, that's quite difficult to do sometimes, and you need to be very clear on what is your innovation. What have you actually invented that's different from what's out in the, the open market? Because you can't legally protect something if it's already out there. So you need to be very clear and have a very clear view on what you've invented. And then you need to document that, and that then needs to be incorporated into any contract. But also, as soon as you start talking to a, uh, a company, you need to protect that information or that intellectual property so getting a non-disclosure agreement in place up front is very important. Even talking to a mentor like myself, you know, it's important even with that to make sure that you're protected. So if you're going to tell somebody something that it gives away the secret of your innovation, you need to protect that up front. And don't feel embarrassed about it. You know, there's no problem whatsoever with talking to somebody and saying, look, I've got this information I want to pass on to you, but I need to protect it. Would you mind signing a non-disclosure um, agreement with me? The next thing then is looking at termination rights. Now, if you take Ruben's example with Julo, say for instance he engaged, uh, he signed a contract with a manufacturer out in the Far East to produce 100,000 Julo units, and then the the company, the buyer, then terminates the contract without cause. Right, so they just decide, right, we're not going to go ahead with this project anymore. We're going to cut the funding to it and terminate it. Ruben would have been left with a, a contractual commitment to actually pay for the devices that were being made by the provider. So you need to think quite carefully about uh, backing up the, you know, if you're signing a contract with, the, with a customer, 
making sure that termination rights are very clear and that uh, you've got some protection in there financially so you don't, don't end up being left in the lurch. Exclusivity we talked about earlier. It's very important to try and think that through and protect that in the contract so you've got a very clear uh, expression of how long you're prepared to allow that company to use your innovation before you have the right then to use it elsewhere. The other interesting aspect uh, for a startup is uh, damages. Um, I'm used to dealing with very large suppliers uh, from my career where you really do want to make sure that you can get uh, damages from them if they fail to, uh, to meet expectations. So a lot of my um, past has been negotiating these damages clauses and limitations of liability from the other side. But when you're a small company or a startup, it's very difficult. You haven't got any assets. They can't come after anything. So what happens there? Um, well, in some cases, they will still insist on you taking out an insurance to protect them against certain liabilities or certain risks. So you may find that you have to get a, a limit or an insurance to, to cover certain types of risks that you're, you're going to be taking and that they're taking in engaging with you. Um, what I want to move on to now is implementation. Uh, a lot of you will have an idea and you'll, be, you'll have this idea with some of your friends and your colleagues in the university and they're people that you go out for a drink with, you might play sport with them and so on and they're people you know quite well socially. When you come on to actually wanting to um, innovate and to produce a, a proposition that goes into a company, it's a totally different arrangement. And you've got a business relationship then with these people. So you have to think very carefully then about whether you've got people with the right skills, whether these people have the same commitment that you have. Right? You have to be very, very clear on that. It's no point engaging with a company and saying, yeah, we can do this wonderful thing for you if the people that you're working with actually haven't got the, um, the same commitment as you and aren't prepared to put the hard work in necessary to, to do this. Because it is risky and it requires an enormous amount of hard work. I'm sure Ruben, and if you talk to Ruben, um, you'll, you'll get a definite impression of that. Well, I know very well he worked all hours on this to try and get uh, uh, Julo adopted. So there's a lot of hard work. So you need to make absolutely certain the people you're going in with have that same level of commitment, that you can rely on them, and also that you trust them and that they trust you. But you're going to have to get into negotiations and discussions and make decisions and the other party that you're, you're working with has to be able to trust you to make decisions that are mutually beneficial. So it is, it is difficult. You need to think about those relationships and whether you've got the capability there to implement what you're, you're proposing. Financial. Uh, will the fees cover the, the risks that you've got and the expenditure that you've got? And this is very important where you've got a technical product of some sort which requires some investment up front in order to produce something that then goes into a production environment, then you get paid. Right? So you need to think about cash flow and about whether you've got a, a pricing mechanism in the agreement that allows you to recover costs uh, in line with your expenditure. But you can very soon get it, particularly with something like, say, Julo, you could get into very serious difficulties if you've committed to spend money, but you aren't getting the, the, the money in from, uh, from your customer. So a lot of the discussion and thought needs to go into handling that cash flow issue and also, then, if you, you do need to do investment up front, where are you going to get the funding from? Because a company will, is quite happy to schedule payments early on because it, they, off, they certainly recognise they're dealing with small organisations and startups. So they're, they're happy to front load things. What they're not happy to do is to fund the development of your business. So you have to be able to split those. You have to think, well, what do I need to do in order to get my company up and running to a point where it's able to do what I want to do here? So that's where you need to then think about going for additional funding to supplement the sort of revenues you'd like to get if you sell on your product. Right? So you need to think that through in terms of costs and then the pricing of the uh, product you're going to sell to the customer. And then ongoing, um, I mentioned earlier ITIL. I think this is extremely important. I, I've started mentioning this now to people up front so that they can at least think this through. You know, if you're going to offer a a service to a, a customer and that's going to be ongoing, in other words you're going to be involved in supporting it, making changes to it, then you need to understand ITIL. And I've given some links in the, um, the document, if you get hold of the document later you'll see that there's some, um, some website links which will give you an in, uh, introduction to ITIL and what it means. And then finally, um, supply chain. 
Uh, if you're going to get some product made, like for instance with Julo, it was the um, USB device, when Ruben was sourcing that from a, a company out in the Far East, you need to make absolutely certain you can rely on that supply chain. So for if you're dealing with a small supplier, you may need to think about having a backup, an alternative supplier, in case that one can't match um, expectations. Because you will end up signing up a contract to deliver things on a certain time and to a certain quality standard. So you need to be very clear that you can source that. So that gives you an idea of some of the risk areas. So I think if you, if you use that as a checklist, think through each of those when you're coming up with your, your, your proposition, and they'll help you to, to answer the sort of questions you'll be asked when you talk to a, a corporate buyer. Now, I want to now think about how you might go about addressing some of those risk areas and, and resolving some of those issues we've talked about. I think one of the key elements, when we talked a lot about contracts, intellectual property, you will need to access legal advice if you come up with an innovation. There's no doubt about that. You can't rely on amateur help in that. You need to get somebody to help you who really knows what they're doing there because that's a very complex area. So you need to have access to the right legal advice to, to handle the IP issues. And again, the um, uh, research and innovation services may be able to help there. And also Rubin has contacts as well out in the um, uh, legal profession that can, can help with some of those, those issues. But you need to be able to fund that, and you need to decide on the right time to involve that expertise, because that's very, it tends to be very expensive. So you need to use it wisely and at the right time. Um, the other key thing that I want to get across is preparation. Well, Ruben and I spent quite a lot of time talking about meetings well before he had the meeting, so that Ruben went into those meetings very well prepared. So he had a very good idea about what he was going to talk about, and he was able to answer questions that might arise in that meeting about some of those risk factors we talked about earlier. So it's, it's very important to, to be well prepared. If you go in there and you're not well prepared, you lose credibility very quickly. They don't expect you to have all the answers, but they expect you to at least understand what they're trying to get at and, and the, the position from their point of view. The next thing then uh, I've talked about was this trust and your team, making sure that your team is able to support what you're trying to achieve. That one is absolutely critical. So again, you can talk to a mentor about how you structure your team, what sort of skills you're going to need in order to develop your proposition. And then insurance. You know, if you're getting to a point where you're close to a deal, you need to be thinking about whether you can insure some of the risks, both for the client and also for yourself. So again, you need advice on, on taking out adequate insurance. But I think one of the most critical areas, and I, I think when Ruben um, certainly demonstrated this in spades, really, is commitment. If you haven't got the time to do this and you're not prepared to be 100%, in fact, 120% involved in developing your proposition and making it work, then don't bother, basically, because this is hard work. You need to be absolutely committed to taking this forward and actually making it work. Because if you're not, the client will spot it. And also, so will your team. And so the people you're working with will see that you're not committed, and therefore you won't get the backup. You know, people won't pull in behind you. But certainly a client will see that. You know, they'll be able to identify that quickly. And I think one of the key areas that pulls it all together, really, is their mentoring. You know, future worlds here is, uh, we've now got, I don't know how many mentors we've got now, Ruben? 35. 35, right. Now, those mentors have a whole range of skills, from technical skills, business skills, negotiation skills, across a whole range of areas that we've, we've covered today. So make use of that. That is a tremendous resource. It really is uh, important that you, you use that. And those people can help you to start thinking through some of the issues we've talked about today, right from the proposition through to how you negotiate, how you handle the whole process of engaging with the corporate. Right. Um, I now want to finish off, really, with some five key lessons out of today's session. So it's really important, if you're thinking about doing something like this, you take these five uh, key things away with you. The first one is think about the proposition. You put a lot of time and thought into that proposition. Use mentors as well to help you develop it. So you've got a very clear idea who you're selling to, what you're selling, um, and how that innovation might actually work. So the proposition is very, very key. The other one is know your limitations. You know, we talked about Julo and some of the limitations there in the ability to deliver and how Ruben dealt with those. And that thinking is absolutely crucial. So do that thinking up front as well. 
and be prepared because I think the customer then will recognize you've got limitations, but they'll think, well, actually, this, this person knows what they're doing. You know, they, they understand their limitations and they're thinking them through. Therefore, they've got credibility. The other thing is know the buyer. If you think of an executive, or if you think of a person in the company that you're dealing with, almost certainly that person is part of a network of, uh, of people that are involved in making a decision to buy. So you need to understand what that person's having to deal with internally in order to get a decision through. So you need to be able to help that person to manage the expectations of those other parts of the organisation. And that's around risk. Understanding all those different risk categories that I talked about earlier and helping that person you're, you're working with to address those internally. That will help to smooth the process of getting a decision. If you don't do that, you'll find that this person may actually find that they just can't handle it. They can't convince people inside that organisation that they understand and are managing the risks. Now, I think the fourth one, then, is understand your risks. So do your own risk assessment. Start thinking about how you're going to handle the risk that you've got so that when you engage and you start negotiating contracts, uh, you're, you're prepared. And then finally, I think this key one about using mentors. I think make use of those people. It's a very unique opportunity in Southampton, and I've never seen anywhere else which has this, this capability. So you've got something here which is very unique. So really make use of it. It is a very, very good capability. So that's um, really all I wanted to talk about today. And I want to now to open it up to the floor for questions. Thank you. And it, ten it depends what sort of meeting it is, really. If it's a meeting with substance, in other words, you're going to actually cover some material issues in that meeting, it's important to have a discussion beforehand. In other words, actually talk to the person and say, what do you expect to get out of this meeting yourself? And actually understand what they're expecting. Then prepare, start to set out an agenda, and then prepare your background, the sort of things that you'll, you will do and you need to prepare in order to go in uh, and answer the questions that person might have. So I think it's very important, to don't be put off. You don't, you don't just have to go in there and meet the person, then find out too late that uh, there's something you could have prepared for. You actually talk to them in advance. And I think they'll feel that you're being professional then. They won't see that as a weakness in any way. They'll be very, they're probably likely to be more impressed the fact that you've, done, you've taken the trouble to do that. It, it depends. If, if you're in a, a very complex negotiation where there are a lot of legal issues, and those tend to get left more towards the end, then you would bring a lawyer in with you if you're going to be resolving specific legal technical issues. But generally speaking, you wouldn't bring the lawyer in. You keep them over to the side, and actually you, you don't um, agree to things in the meeting uh, that need extra help. And, and actually people, are, people understand this in negotiation. They understand that if you've got a, an issue like that, you might want to actually take it offline and deal with it separately, then come back in. And often what, uh, what I've done, certainly, if I've been in that position, is I've called a halt to the meeting and said, look, I'm sorry, I do need to resolve this. And previously, I've arranged to make sure that my lawyer is actually on, on call. I'll then take a break, go out, talk to the lawyer, and then come back into the meeting. Okay, so that's, that's generally the way I'll do that. It's probably more explicit in big corporates. They actually, they consciously think about risk. They do risk assessments and they document it and they have a rigorous process of assessing the, the financial implications of risk. In an SME, you'll find that they do exactly the same. You know, they think these, these risks through. They don't necessarily uh, document them or, or bring them out explicitly. But they are thinking in terms of reputation, financial risk, supply chain risk, all those other things. So this is a good discipline to get into, even if you're dealing with small companies. If you go through this process of thinking of these risk categories, and I've listed some of them in the presentation, it'll help you even dealing with small to medium enterprises, because they have exactly the same risks. It may be that there's an individual who's got those in, his, in their mind, and they're thinking those through, but they haven't actually spelt them out. So it is important to still use the same sort of risk categories I've used here. It can. And in fact, that's often the reason why things don't get through. 
is because those risks are there. You know, people are thinking about those risks, and actually they'll go quite some way down exploring an innovation, then they'll stop because basically they haven't been able to address the risks. But that's, in a way, why you need to think the proposition through very carefully, because there will be benefits. So the benefits that your, your proposition holds for the company should outweigh the risks. In other words, they should be willing to go ahead because there's so much benefit of implementing what you're doing that it will outweigh those risks. And that's part of your proposition and how you communicate that proposition to the company. So if you can show, you know, you, say for instance you go into a meeting and you say, right, okay, I, I accept there are these risks, but these are the benefits you're getting and, and these are how they offset those risks. So having that understanding and demonstrating it to that company will help them to, to get over that hurdle. If you don't think about the risks, then you run, you, you run the risk basically, you're getting some way down the road and then cutting it because they suddenly think of a major risk. So it's, it's certainly, um, it's not something you should think of negatively really. Risk is a tool. It basically helps you to, to work through the thinking around how you, you uh, make sure you do get the benefits out of the innovation and that your customer gets the benefits out of the innovation at an acceptable risk to both you and them. I think so it's, it's used as a tool really. Don't make too much of it, but certainly do that thinking. Any, any big corporate will, will certainly list the benefits, but they'll also have people that are looking at the risks. And if you've done that thinking and you can actually match those off and you can say actually, uh, even though you've got that risk, that's more than outweighed by the benefits and we've got a way of mitigating that risk to help you, then you've, you've nailed it at an early stage. The danger, and certainly the danger I've seen many times actually, is that people get quite some way down the, the path, they've done a lot of work, put an enormous amount of negotiation work in, only for a risk to come up at the last minute that floors it. Okay? If you've done that thinking early on and you've nailed it, you stand much more chance of getting through the process and actually the confidence in you increases. They think this person really knows what they're doing and uh, they understand my position, so I've, I, they, you gain credibility and respect. I think there's, there's no escaping it. At some point you will have to pay for legal advice, so you, you will need some um, capability to, to fund that. So that's one of the things you need to think about in, in terms of a startup. You need some seed funding to enable you to get the right sort of advice and, um, and get yourself in a position where you can take on something like this. So funding will be an issue. But first step is to talk to people like Ruben and, and Michelle here so that they can point you in the direction of people who can give you initial advice. Right. At some point you will need to get a, an expert, and they are costly, but you can actually get around that to a large extent initially just by talking to mentors or people that have got experience in these areas to give you a starting point. When you get to a point then where you think, yeah, I am actually now at a point where I'm going to have to make a commitment, or somebody's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in negotiations now, I'm going to have to start drawing up a contract, then you do abs absolutely need to have legal advice then. Some of them are industry specific. Uh, an example of that would be in the financial services industry. There are a lot of issues around um, uh, giving advice. So I know, Xavier, I've talked to you about um, you know, if you're producing an innovation that gets involved in advice, then there are regulations that apply to it. So there's regulatory risks that are specific to industries. But there are also general risks out there that uh, things like supply chain risk, um, operational risk around those service management processes, those things are pretty standard. You know, they, they exist in all businesses. So there are a whole set of generic risks, but there are also industry-specific risks. And that, again, is where you can get help from some of the mentors, because ment mentors, have, a lot of them have had experience across a wide range of different industries. And they may, may be able to give you pointers about industry-specific or country-specific risk that you need to consider in your proposition. Um, it's, I suppose it's showing that you, you have an understanding of the risks, but presenting them in the context of the benefits. So that's the way to tackle it, really. Um, I think if you show no um, understanding of risk, it won't get very far, basically, uh, because it won't have credibility. I think if you can go in and show that you've thought through the benefits and you've also thought about the risks and how you're going to address those and how the client might actually be able to address those, that's a much more compelling case.
you know, it comes across much better. It shows that you've put the thought in and it gives you more credibility. I think so that it's, it actually helps your, your case. So don't think of risk as negative, right? If it's done in the right way and presented in the right way, it's very positive uh, to a buyer that you've thought those things through. I think one, one key thing, and I, I remember you did this actually, Ruben uh, did a really good presentation at one point. He put together a risk profile for him. He actually set out what his risk was uh, in uh, producing the Julo product to fit in with their schedule of marketing and rollout of the product. And he was able to demonstrate by that presentation to the client that because he was a small startup and didn't have significant uh, resources, that they needed to front load some of that funding. So I think it's, it's perfectly all right. And it's actually, again, it, it's down to credibility. It shows that you thought these things through. And if you can make a good case, then that company will say, ah, yeah, I can see that actually. In fact, it's in my interest to front load that payment so that that um, startup has enough funds to be able to do this work properly. Okay, so it's, it's producing the case and actually making sure you communicate that very well. And I say Ruben did a really good job of that. I, I remember the presentation very well. It was, uh, it was it's quite a, a good way of doing it, I think. I think, I think it's important you do your own research and you prepare well. So looking at the market, understanding what their competitors are doing, and actually bringing that to bear then when you put your proposition to them. That again, is, that's very powerful. Is if you can show that you understand the market they're in and the risk that they got about not innovating. For instance, if you know, for example, that somebody else has just brought something else out that could start attacking their control of the market or their share of the market, then that's a really good way of demonstrating the importance of them taking a gamble, actually taking the risk with you to, to do something. So it's doing that market research and preparation that it really it gives you a really good sound backing and, uh, and there's plenty out in the internet now you know, there's a, a lot you can do yourself without having to access specialists and so on you can do a lot of research about companies and their competitors and how they're faring and that's that's a really good question because i think if you if you're dealing with someone that is actively looking for innovations then they're prepared to look at something at a much earlier stage and these are th they, they often go to trade fairs or fairs where um, people are putting their innovations and their ideas out for the first time. And also they read and review uh, magazines and um, uh, industry papers to see what people are thinking of. So there are companies out there that are looking for that initial spark and they'll then take that and, and they'll, they'll try to help you to incubate that idea further. But there are companies out there that uh, are, at a, I suppose, um, how to describe it, there are much more primitive in the way that they look at innovation. They don't tend to um, innovate themselves and they also find it very difficult to deal with people that are innovators. And with those, I think you'd have to be more developed. You'd have to have something that has more, um, more thought around it, how it would apply to that company and how it would handle some of the risks that we talked about earlier. So I think it depends on the, the company and how, how um, ready they are to accept innovation. I think uh, if you've got, say for you've got an idea which um, uh, you think has, is unique, you've, you've thought through an algorithm or some idea where you think, actually, I've thought of something here that doesn't exist. I think it's important if you start talking to anyone about that, even mentors, you might, you might think, well, actually, a mentor could take that idea away and reuse it, or uh, hopefully they wouldn't. But you then need to think, right, I've got this idea now. I want someone to sign a non-disclosure agreement upfront uh, so that it is protected. I suppose if, you, if you're having your initial discussions, you know, talking about concepts, then you don't need that. But if you're starting to get into, what, into the detail and you're starting to talk to them about what your innovation is, then you may, you may need to get something in place then to protect yourself. And it depends what stage you're at. If you're, if you're refining it and you're sort of developing your idea, then obviously you can't, you know, you can't do that, I think. But once you've got your idea there, then it's worth trying to protect it. 
And again, mentors can help you with that. You know, they can help you to assess the risk and, uh, and uh, guide you on when it's appropriate to start doing that. Okay. Should we give Chris a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you.